what's up everybody welcome back to my channel my name is Jay and you're watching Clouded Reactions so today we're going to be listening to the third track on the album Carolus Rex titled Got Mit Uns and it's the English edition so the first track is actually an intro into the second track which is uh, Lions from the North I can't believe Lions from the North is at or Lions Lion from the North is actually the first track of the album like they started the album strong and actually, speaking of which, I know that song was like my number one favorite for a while. Turns out it changed, and I didn't even notice when. I was um, I haven't been to the gym, or I haven't been able to go to the gym now that I've been posting YouTube videos, and editing and recording actually takes some time. So instead of going to the gym, I hit my ex uh, my exercising bike, and then I go in the backyard and I lift some cinder blocks. But while I was outside yesterday, last night. I was listening. I was, I was listening to music, listening to my cinder blocks, and guess what song came on? First, I mean, for some reason, I don't know. I guess just listening to it randomly made me appreciate it more. But I think my new favorite song is Bismarck. I don't. Can you believe that? I can't even believe that. I was like, wait, wait a minute. Why is this? Why is this slapping extra hard today than it was the other days? I, I don't know. So I will be listening to like the Swedish versions as well, just not right now. Probably at a later date. Right now, I just want to hear the music. I want to learn the history, mainly the history. But you know what? The music is, I'm like, I'm almost every song. I think the only song I haven't added to my playlist was, um, no, no, I think they're all added to a playlist. Anyway, let's just hop right on in. <laughs> So, so far it seems like they're just describing some sort of event, a battle. They're saying fire at will, aim for their cannons, which is always a good thing. Counterattack, thunder of guns, which means just a hailstorm of guns probably. So, so far they're describing, and then they said at the beginning, marching, what did they say? They slept in formation and marched through the night, something like that. Cavalry charge, follow that banner after the king, freedom we bring. That's kind of, that's really painting a nice picture of like, you know, er, you know, just the formation of the lines of the army. And then the, it says after the king. So maybe the king charged ahead with the banner and they're like, yo, like follow the king, protect your king. I've seen a lot of movies where I guess it's like that. So this is describing a, a scenario that I can actually relate to that I have seen before in movies. And also they said it started in September and they had, um... The enemy had attacked seven times, and they're they're able to repel the attack seven times. I'm not sure who they're fighting in this right now, but I'm sure they'll uh, say it later on.
just me or what is was I expecting like a, a second here we are like here we are here we are like something like that I don't know why I was expecting it they didn't put it in but um, I, I kept adding it for some reason because I thought it was coming sometimes when you listen to a lot of music you kind of I guess you get familiar with like repetitive melodies and beats so you expect to hear certain things so they kind of switch it up it's kind of interesting I really like the beat too. It was, it was it was a constant. There wasn't a whole lot of breaks in between the quatrains or, or in between like each verse. It was it was more of a it was more it was just a more steady, constantly hitting you with what they're saying. So I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the beat. It was more like a it was a kind of a uplifting type of beat. Kind of like a I don't know how to explain it. More where have I heard that sound? It kind of sounds I don't know. But let's go ahead and just jump into the history behind this. So it's about the 30 years war. And also before the song, uh, before I had to actually listen to the song, I googled what God, what God meant Un stood for, and that means God with us. So when they're saying all that, they're saying they're chanting God with us. You guys already know I didn't. I just want to let you guys know that I know. Okay. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Power from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. For most of its history, Sweden had not been really involved in the affairs of mainland Europe. But we sent an army to the south and become a great power. Yes. Yes, I hear you just fine. Okay, yeah, we're rolling. All right, I'll talk to you later. Okay. The war within the Holy Roman Empire, between the irreconcilably divided camps of Catholics and Jesuits on one side, and the Lutheran, Calvinist, Protestants on the other, had been raging for 12 years, as King Gustav II Adolf of Sweden landed with 16,000 men on the shores of Pomerania in the summer of 1630. It had seemed as if the war was finally coming to an end. The imperial forces of the Habsburg Emperor and the Catholic Holy League had won victory after victory over the Protestant rebellion and had even defeated a Danish intervention. Gustav Adolf planned to succeed where the Danes had failed, choosing to intervene on the side of the Protestants and to prolong the war. See, the war between Catholics and Protestants was as much about politics and influence as it was a war about religion. And the last thing, the ambitious up and coming. I don't know if a lot of people know that. I know you guys probably know that, but if you guys are new to my channel and you're watching this all this history with me, um, back in the day, and I'm talking about back in the day, day, religions were kind of like the ultimate supreme power. Even kings, rulers, bended their knee to religion. Back then, religion was like top and then rulers and then or maybe the pope and then rulers and then you know those are those an order but definitely religion is kind of pretty much called the shot if you control the religion you pretty much control the politics the swedish empire wanted was catholic interference in their realm of influence so the king chose to intervene with the protestants still the overall success of his venture was bound with cooperation with the protestant german dukes and knights that aristocracy at first, however, looked upon Gustav Adolf's army not as a savior, nor even as an ally, but as a foreign invader, and yet another player on this chaotic chessboard that was later to be known as the Thirty Years' War. For now, a 16,000-man army that was quickly bolstering its ranks with both German and foreign mercenaries was just as dangerous to them as the Catholic forces were. The Swedes were an unknown quantity and many viewed them as some sort of semi-barbaric savages who had just popped out of the Middle Ages into modernity. One of the few of the Germans that openly sided with the Swedish king was a guy called Christian Wilhelm, dispossessed mayor of the city of Magdeburg, who forced his way back to power and declared his support for the Swedes. Well, the commanders of the Holy League, the Count of Tilly and his imperial field marshal, the Earl of Pappenheim, were not about to ignore that, and their forces advanced on Magdeburg and lay siege to it. But as Magdeburg then waited for Swedish help, Gustav Adolf was not able to provide it because of the hesitation of the Protestant dukes and knights in Saxony and Brandenburg in joining him. So Magdeburg eventually fell on May 10, 1631. And that city's fall was perhaps the most terrible event of the Thirty Years' War, and certainly its worst civilian massacre, rape, 
pillaging and murder were the orders of the day, and over 20,000 inhabitants were put to the sword in a drunken rage. This brutal sacking was what finally pushed the northern Protestant duchies into the King of Sweden's camp. Gustav Adolf crossed the Elbe River and moved south into Saxony to link up his now 23,000 men strong army with an additional 16,000 Saxons. The Count of Tilly, with his 39,000 men, rode north to engage them. The broad plains near the village of Breitenfeld was where Tilly chose to make battle. He ordered his infantry, in traditional Spanish fashion, into 17 large squares where musketeers were protected by a large force of pikemen. His 27 cannons were placed on a hill near the center. The elite heavily armored cuirassiers of the Earl of Pappenheim formed on the left, while the right wing was manned by the Duke of Furstenberg's 3,000 heavy cavalrymen and 900 mounted Croats. On the misty morning of September 17, 1631, the Swedish and Saxon troops entered the battlefield and came immediately under cannon fire. Gustav Adolf had put his men in lines known as Swedish Brigades, a new tactic of his own, with six ranks of musketeers protected by blocks of pikemen. So while relying on the power of concentrated musket fire, he could keep more men in reserve and allow his army to be more flexible. He ordered the Saxons to keep his left flank secure, and his own cavalry held the right. At midday, the Swedish artillerymen were finally firing back. With 68 guns, the Swedes packed not only double the amount of artillery, but their gunners were also better drilled. The Swedish artillery could fire up to three times faster than their opponents. A two-hour artillery duel saw the superior Swedish artillery take a heavy toll on the tightly packed imperial formations. Casualties were high as the 24-pounders tore into the ranks. But the Saxons on the Swedish left, who also fought in tight formations, were also wavering under the heavy cannon fire. By 2 p.m., Pappenheim on the Imperial left had had enough of waiting around. Against Tilly's orders, he ordered his cuirassiers to move out against the Swedish infantry. The cuirassiers were the finest troops in the Imperial army. Heavily armored from head to toe, they rode out in tight formation. And once close to an enemy, they would fire their pistols and charge with swords in hand into the decimated ranks. That, at least, was the theory. But discipline wasn't always that enforced, and it became typical that instead of charging, the cuirassiers simply fired their pistols and then rode around the formation to let the others take their shots until the enemy was weak enough for a safe charge. This was the case at Breitenfeld, but the Swedish brigades were a natural counter to that. As the cuirassiers came close, the musket-heavy Swedish formations concentrated their fire in a deadly salvo, as all ranks fired at once. Each time the cuirassiers moved into fire, they were met by a murderous hail of bullets and repulsed. At the same time, on the other flank, the already shaken Saxons were attacked by the cavalry and the fearsome Croats. The Saxon infantry offered stiff resistance initially, but eventually broke and ran from the battlefield with Furstenberg's men in hot pursuit. Tilly, who had forbidden both of his commanders to ride out on their own, now saw his chance to roll up the Swedes from the flank. He ordered his men to advance, shifting his whole army to swing around. But his tightly packed formations were slow. And before the right wing of the infantry could move into the gap the Saxons had left behind, Gustav Adolf was able to send his second line in to meet the Imperial advance. So while the Swedes had withheld a strong tactical advance, the Imperials were now overextending themselves. The whole center shifted to the right to avoid gaps of their own, and the smoke of the guns and the dust of marching feet created chaos on the field. The Catholics cheered for Father Tilly or yelled Jesus Maria to identify themselves in the melee. The Swedish battle cry was Gott mit uns, an old saying the Teutonic Knights used in the Baltics and which originated from early Christian times. Soon, Pappenheim was forced to call off his attack. His cuirassiers had taken the worst in the engagement by far. Seeing Pappenheim's men wavering, though, Gustav Adolf ordered a counterattack of his own. The Swedish cavalry advanced, immediately routing the cuirassiers, and then turned on the weekend and now exposed left flank of the imperial front line. The battle had dramatically shifted in favor of the Swedes. Now, 
they were the ones outflanking the Imperials as the Swedish right wing moved up. Furstenberg's cavalry had exhausted themselves in pursuing the Saxon infantry and plundering their baggage, and they in turn were now met by the Swedish reserves and Saxony's household cavalry. Tilly's infantry was mauled by the stronger Swedish firepower. Without cavalry to fear, the Swedish proved superior in open battle. And as Tilly's cannons were taken by the Swedish encircling move, battle turned into a disaster for the Imperials. Tilly ordered a full retreat before being totally surrounded. Discipline held for a few moments, but as the Swedes brought their cannons into range, the battle was effectively over. The Imperials ran for the hills. Gustav Adolf had lost around 2,000 of his men and 1,500 Saxons, while 7,000 Catholics and Imperials lay dead on the battlefield. A further 6,000 became prisoners and were immediately pressed into the Swedish ranks. Tilly himself was wounded, but was able to escape. For the Swedes, this was a resounding victory. The next day, the Protestant propaganda machine was in full motion. A glorious victory. Divine retribution for Magdeburg. The lion from the north had triumphed over the imperial eagle. In fact, the Catholics had suffered their first major defeat since the beginning of the war. And the Protestants all over Germany were again taking up arms. The Battle of Breitenfeld was not only a demonstration of the superior skill and tactics of the Swedish monarch, it also made Gustav Adolf larger than life. He was hailed almost as a biblical figure like Joshua or, or a new Alexander, who would now march south towards Vienna and then even Rome itself. Gustav Adolf mania gripped the Protestant strongholds, and men began styling their beards like the Swedish king. But you know, it's a long way to Vienna. And although he had achieved a spectacular victory, his enemies were anything but beaten. 20,000 of the emperor's men were already forming in Silesia, and Tilly was determined to raise a new army to avenge his defeat. For the moment, the Swedes were forced to make camp for winter and gather more support for the battles yet to come. The war, which had seemed over weeks earlier, was beginning again and would continue for nearly two more decades. He was the Elvis of 1632. That was that was Gustav Adolf. We got a picture, please. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. So everybody start doing their beard like that again. Okay, Gothmittons. I mean, you know, this was obviously a major a major turning point in Swedish history. Now, the song itself. How do you see it musically? The music for this one. It sounds very much like uh, some some melodies are traditional of folk Swedish folk music. Yeah. And that was the whole idea. You know, when we were doing the Carolus Rex album, we. Folklore, that's what it sounds I mean, I was trying to describe what, the, the, what it sounded like, that da, 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 da. It, it sounds folklore-ish. Like, you kind of hear it in, like, uh, I don't want to say, like, in, like, old times, like, uh, medieval. Um, and that tune kind of sounded, like, folklore-ish. I, 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 that's a pretty, yeah, perfect, yeah, there it is. Took a lot of impressions and ideas from Swedish folk music. Really? And normally we write always the music and we don't care about the topic and we add the topic as a secondary layer onto the music. But we knew that we were working on Carolus Rex and we felt as well when, uh, when the song was recorded like, oh my god, it's, it's a very, very funny song. It's a very uplifting song. It should be a crowd favorite. It's something that we really want to perform live. Everybody in the band was always excited about playing it, and still today. And and funny enough, I mean, doing the recording for it, um, there are some vocal lines that that is being sung not by Joachim, but it's supposed to be sung by band members. But at this time, the band members didn't show up this day. Funny enough. Funny enough. Uh, during You'd the think recording. think they were very responsible, being musicians. And, uh, and in the morning, instead, the producer of this album, Peter Tekken, decided to do the vocal lines himself. Oh, okay, everybody. And, and he, he, he was doing that really well, and it sounded... And we also, 
performed live with him a couple of times where he came onto the stage and performing his parts. Okay. If he's not there, yeah. it's usually sung that like one of the verses is sung by, uh, by one guitar player and one by the other one. And then we all fill in. And it, there has been parts sometimes when we have performed this song even without Joachim on the stage. And he gets his bathroom break. He gets a bathroom break or whatever he wants to probably do during that time. He probably drinks a beer because it also, you know, we, we change the lyrics a little bit around to funny because in Germany when we play, some people um, always shout instead of Sabaton, Sabaton, they shout Noch ein Bier, Noch, Noch ein, ein Bier. Bier. And uh, so... Wait, wait, can we, can, we ins can we insert a chant of that? He decided, okay, let's change the lyrics one night uh, as we all drink together drink forever no i beer now have you played it recently in any of your shows here it's been a while since we performed the song but i'm sure that we bring it back every now and then it's a great song for us to play there are there are songs who are more and less fun to play for yeah. us as band members primo victoria is one of those songs it's it's horrible as a musician because the song is so simple yeah. but it becomes powerful yeah, to crowd, play. Yeah. But Got Me Tunes has, it's fun to play as a musician. Yeah. It's an uplifting song and it's a crowd favorite. Well, I, I want to end this today. I want everybody to help me out here. Knock ein Bier. Knock ein Bier. Knock ein Bier. Knock ein Bier. See you next time on Sabaton History. That's it for this week's of Sabaton History Channel. Remember, if you're a patron, you can get the Sabaton albums in a very nice uh, edition featuring Indy Nidell talking about the history behind the songs. So check that out. That's interesting to hear. So is that like they only change the lyrics up when, it, when they're interpreting it from Swedish to English? Or do they actually have two different types, two different um, versions of the same song? So I don't really know a whole lot about the 30 Years War, so I'm really excited to not learn uh, to listen to this whole album because pretty much can explain it for me and then if I don't get the song if I don't get all the permission for the song thank god we have the Sabaton History Channel to explain it to us you know because we're not that smart over here no we are not but um, I'm gonna listen to one more and then I'm gotta go to work dang that sucks but I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the reaction I certainly enjoyed the video um, don't subscribe if you don't want to but if you like the video it really helps my channel grow helps me get out there and yeah, stay safe, stay blessed, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.